Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Thank you very much for coming out. A wonderful turnout. I uh, love uh, that people are uh, passionate about travel photography. So we'll go right into it. I'm going to stand right here because I need to advance from the computer. So I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I'll give you a brief explanation of what a shot list is because today we're talking about improving your photography by working from a shot list. I'll tell you exactly what that is. I'm going to give you my number one photo tip I guarantee will take your photography to another level. I don't care what level you're at, what kind of phone, uh, iPhone, camera that you use, whatever, this one tip will take your photography to another level. I've got a lot of other travel and photography tips that we'll talk about. I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. And uh, question and answers we're going to hold till the end. Because we're recording, it's going to be easier if we do it at the end instead of uh, throughout. OK? And uh, I'll, you've got these sheets. If anyone needs one of these sheets, we still have some more here. But if you join my mailing list at photoenrichment.com, everyone gets a free copy of my uh, Ralph Velasco on travel photography. It's 101 <laughs> tips for developing your photographic eye and more. And that's a 150 page plus ebook. So you could read it on any reader. And I think you'll get some nice tips out of it. So join my list and you get a free copy of that. Can you get the address again? It's right at the bottom here throughout, but it's photoenrichment.com. And I will certainly tell you about it at the end photoenrichment.com. So, a bit about my background. I've tried a lot of different careers. I've owned two restaurants. I was um, uh, director of marketing for a Fortune 500 company, a division of a Fortune 500 company. I sold real estate. Uh, most recently, before I started doing this full time, I was a financial advisor. Okay, so I founded the company in 2005 doing it part-time while I was a financial advisor. So during the day, I would be doing my stocks and bonds and stuff. At night, I was teaching travel photography at the local community college, uh, city of Newport Beach, where I was living in Southern California, uh, adult education type things uh, here at, at camera stores, things like that. So trying a lot of different careers. But we all know what happened in 2008, right? September 2008. So. I say I've been doing this full time for about seven years because in September 2008 we had the financial crisis, right? So that was the kick in the pants that I needed to get out of that industry, which I absolutely abhorred, and do what I was doing and what I loved. So best thing that ever happened to me, at least, was that financial crisis because it got me to be doing this full time. Since then, uh, my company, which is essentially me and uh, one or two other very, very part-time assistants, uh, have organized and led over 50 international tours around the world. I've done 14 people-to-people -people programs to Cuba. I'll be heading to Cuba in about a month for my 15th trip there. And uh, one of the great places to uh, travel to, of course, uh, it's been very much on the, uh, the travel photographers list now, and I know a lot of people want to go there if they haven't been already. My recommendation is go now. It's changing very quickly. I uh, mentioned the book, 101 Tips for Developing Your Photographic Eye and More. That was my first book that I wrote. I also got another book out called Essence of a Place. It's a travel photographer's guide to using a shot list for capturing any destination. And that went direct to ebook. So uh, if you go to my website, you can find that. It's, I think, $4.99. And again, read it on any reader. It was optimized for the iPad, though, so some, there's some little extra features in there if you read it on an iPad. So, uh, but if you want to learn more about this idea of working from a shot list, that would be one place to go. I've also got an iPhone app that I created. It's only for iOS devices, so iPhone, iPad, iPod Touch. Uh, unfortunately, if you're on other platforms, it's not going to uh, work for you. We just haven't gotten around to putting it onto other platforms. As you can imagine, it takes a lot of time and money to create these apps, and so I just haven't gotten around to putting it on other platforms. But there is a post on my website where I show all 52 categories, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, exactly what that is. 
but that's called My Shot List for Travel, and uh, we'll talk about that more. Uh, any of you listen to This Week in Photo podcast? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, I love podcasts. They're like online radio shows with very few, if any, commercials. Whatever interest you have, I don't care what it is, someone's got a podcast for it. And they're free, and you download them on iTunes. So there's probably the most popular one is called This Week in Photo. It's a weekly photo show. And they're starting to do individual photographers that are coming in and having specialized podcasts, such as uh, street photography, wedding photography, uh, family photography. Well, I'm going to be starting one called You Are Here with Ralph Velasco, and it's going to be a travel photography podcast. So hopefully in the next uh, couple months, we'll start putting episodes up, but I'll be uh, going around the world interviewing travel photographers that have a specialty in a particular destination, and we're going to talk to them so that if you go to that place, now you've got some inside information about how to shoot it better. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I was just recently told in November that I was a finalist for the Travel Photographer of the Year Award. You may have heard of it. It's a fairly prestigious award. Uh, you can see my name right there <laughs> as one of the 2015 finalists. Unfortunately, they announced the winners and I didn't win. But I can take solace in the fact that I lost to a National Geographic photographer who has won the, this award before and many others. So I don't mind. Uh, being behind someone like that. So it's just an honor to be recognized as one of the finalists. Okay, enough about me. Uh, let's get into this idea of a shot list. So a shot list is absolutely essential. What it is, is it's a checklist. It's simply a list of the kinds of shots that you should be aware of when you're in a place. Now, this is not an idea that I thought of. This has been around since the dawn of photography. It's meant to be an organizational tool. So what I've done is put it in your pocket with the iPhone or even an iPad or iPod Touch, like I said, uh, because I've always, I'd always worked from a shot list, and photographers have been for the past 150 years, but they were using pen and paper, uh, you know, maybe an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you can use a notes app. You don't need my app to do this. They didn't for the past 147 years. But it's meant to give you a framework and to remind you of the types of shots that you should be aware of in a place. So what I like to think of, the way to look at it is it breaks down a very daunting task. You know, we get to these destinations and it could be a region of the world like Patagonia could be a city like Prague, could be a country like Cambodia. So we get to these places and it's like, okay, now what? Now what do I do? Where do I start? Well, this shot list gives you a framework and a, a list of shots that you should be thinking of. And the idea is for it to ensure variety. So I'm sure you've all sat through many slideshows you know, family and friends asking you, hey, I just got back from uh, Morocco, want to see my slideshow? And sometimes you're like, uh, okay, <laughs> you know, because you've been there before, right? Well, I'm sure I used to create those kinds of slideshows and we all did as well. But if you have an interest in a particular type of photography, maybe for you it's landscape or portrait photography or uh, architectural photography, whatever, whatever it might be, and you go to a place and you only show those kinds of pictures, you're going to bore your audience pretty soon, don't you think? You know, we've all sat through slideshows of 300 of even the most wonderful landscapes in the world, but you know, after the 20th or 30th one, you're kind of like, well, did anything else? You know, was there anything else in that place? Yeah, I'll just see it right here, ma'am. So. The idea is to bring back a variety of images for travel photography. Okay, as travel photographers, we have to be jacks of all trades, masters of some, right? So we have to be pretty good at a lot of different types of photography and hopefully very good at several types. So what I did with the app is I, I say that it's meant to inspire you. And I'm gonna show you a couple screenshots here well, this is the name of the app called My Shot List for Travel. It's free. 
So I'm not here to sell you the app. I am here to sell you on the idea of working from a shot list. Again, whether you use my app or a spreadsheet or pen and paper, it's up to you. But it's available for free on iTunes. So what, what I would do on my trips, and it's come to be called Shake Your App. So uh, every morning someone would remind me, hey, Ralph, shake your app. So I'd take the, my iPhone with the app open, and I would shake it. And I'll show you a screenshot here. There's this little challenge me feature at the bottom. You can either shake the device or tap that button and up will pop a new category. So we started with an empty shot list and I'd shake the device and up would pop a new category that would be then be that category for the day. So let's say it was uh, history. So for that day we need to be thinking about photograph, photo opportunities that have to do with history or interiors. How are we going to photograph the interiors of places? So these are just 10 or 12 different categories out of the 52 that I put into the shot list, uh, the, the app. Now there's probably hundreds of categories, but I didn't want it to be overwhelming. I wanted it to be something that people would actually use. So I limited it to 52 categories. But that challenge me feature is meant to inspire you. So it brings up a new category, and then that's what you need to think about for that day. You know, the more you know what you're looking for, the more you're likely to see it, notice it, and be able to photograph it. That's also why I recommend having a theme in mind at the beginning of my trips. I say, okay, everyone's got to have a theme that they want to use throughout this trip, that they want to think about throughout this trip. It could be people at work or hands, the color red, whatever that might be. Uh, and as soon as we go around the room, and I always have a meet and greet at the beginning so everyone gets to know each other, uh, and people start saying, okay, I'm going to photo, you know, my theme is going to be bicycles. Well, what do you think you start seeing everywhere is all those other people's themes, right? So it puts it in your head, you start thinking about it, you'll start to see it everywhere. Kind of like when you buy a new car and it seems like everyone's got that car now, right? So if you tap on any one of those ca previous categories on that previous screenshot, let's say markets, up pops a little blurb about what markets are to me. There's a sample picture. You can tap on the picture. It pop, pops up full screen. Tap it. It goes away. And then there's something called my data. So here you can put in notes to yourself about that category, about that place. You could input your own pictures from your phone your device into that category and then write notes on them. So I like to think that the app is well worth every penny and it's free. <laughs> so uh, if you have an iOS device, please download it and, and I hope you use it and maybe put in a review on iTunes. But again, not here to sell you the app, it's free, but I am here to sell you on this idea. You can also share your photos, of course. Right. So I mentioned that it's free. Now, just let me give you an idea of some of the travel that I've done over the past year. I, I'm, I'm what's called location independent. That's like this new term. Uh, originally, I'm from Chicago. I lived in Southern California for 15 years. Uh, now I have no home, no real home. I got rid of 90% of my stuff. The rest of it's in my mother's basement. Uh, when I'm back in the U.S. for five days here or ten days there, uh, typically I'll s maybe stay with her or friends in Southern California where I used to live. But otherwise I'm on the road uh, about nine months out of the year. So then I come back every now and then for uh, like usually the first quarter of the year I'm doing a lot of speaking engagements. Uh, on Saturday I'll be at the travel, travel show, the New York Times travel show. So if anyone wants to come out for that. But I'm on the road a lot. Uh, this past year, I led nine tours. I uh, had over 100 clients on those tours. And I also scouted four trips. So scouting, if you're not familiar with it, means that I just go in advance, a uh, place that I have in mind for a tour, 
and I work with a local guide, fixer, tour operator that will help me put together an itinerary. Uh, typically, we'll see probably three or four times the amount of uh, actual sites and have experiences, uh, three or four times the amount that I'll actually include in the trip because I don't want the trip to be a whirlwind where you do a lot of stuff but you don't remember any of it. So I'll tell you more about that in a bit. But uh, scouting in advance, extremely important. So I scouted four trips for this year, 2016, uh, in um, 2015. Now, Let's talk about just a few categories of a shot list and I'm gonna show you some examples. Details. So zooming in on the details. Now, I always recommend trying to get that overall establishing shot, which is typically sort of the postcard shot that you're, you know, when you get to a destination. Then look for the medium and the detail shots that make up that scene. If you'll do that, Number one, you're gonna get a lot of different types of images. So oftentimes I'm asked, Ralph, how would you photograph this, this scene? You know, we're standing there with a group. How would you photograph this scene? I say, well, probably 10 or 12 different ways, right? I'm gonna get that overall, medium, detail shots. I'm gonna get a landscape version. I'm gonna get a portrait version with people, without people. You know, that right there's six or eight different ways to photograph the place. Okay, so zooming in on the details. So obviously there's a, another, <laughs> there's a full person here, but I chose to zoom in on these feet. And this is a, a young girl in Cambodia. I'll show you her face in, uh, in just a few minutes. Hands, again, talking about there being a theme in mind. So uh, this is a man sorting black peppercorns in Kampot, Cambodia, which is known as one of the best places for, uh, for that type of spice. Here a man who was with his wife in a field in Romania, we pulled over, uh, they were, they were uh, harvesting potatoes. So getting in on the details, looking at those hands. Again, this could be that theme of hands or people at work. Here's sort of a medium shot. Now this is a shot I made in Turkey. This man uh, makes these sort of sandals. And so we're walking along as a group and Two or three of us, you know, kind of peeked in his shop and walked inside, started photographing, and he didn't even look up from his, uh, from his uh, work, work table. He just was sitting there hammering away, making these, these uh, little uh, sandals. So this is uh, probably a, more of a medium shot. Then I got a portrait version, kind of overlooking him. And then I go in for more of a detail shot. So same man, same shop, three very distinct pictures. And there's probably dozens more that I took or could have taken. So I encourage you to do that. Remember, we're talking about variety. Uh, this is a place called the Hill of Crosses in Lithuania. It's, this, uh, it's a hill that started out with a single cross, and now there are literally tens of thousands of crosses. Now this again is one of those more overall establishing shots. Here's sort of a medium shot of one of the bigger crosses. And then I start to look for the details. So people just come to this place and they continually are adding crosses and um, it's a really interesting place and something that we do on my Capitals of the Baltics tour. So there's an infinite amount of shots that you could take in this one location because uh, it's, it's so fascinating and, and big. Here, my local guide in uh, Lithuania, she, uh, we went to a place where they were harvesting potatoes, but then the man said, you know, over there I've got this huge field of raspberries. So we went over there to, to look at the raspberries. Now, I don't like the way that she's in sunlight and also in shadow. So always I try to get my subject into the shade. Uh, I don't like direct sunlight, uh, especially don't like that mixed light, typically. Um, you know, and, there, and, and there's always gonna be a little degradation up here, so if you look at the screen over here, it's really what the shot looked like. 
but uh, with all these lights and everything, it kind of blows out here. But so that's more of a medium shot, you know, partial body shot of her. Then I go horizontal, and now I'm more zooming in on the raspberries in her hand. And then I get in even closer. Okay, now here we have a nice even light. So you can get that idea. Instead of just taking one shot of her holding these raspberries, I've taken at least three shots that are very different. Never know when you're putting together a book or a website or something and you need a portrait version of something instead of a landscape version. You've got these different layouts. So give yourself those options. Instead of having to crop in on that first shot, which I could have done, but now what's happening? I'm losing all those pixels, right? I can only blow it up so big uh, for whatever my use is. Uh, here, a thousand year old piece of ice from a glacier on the black sand beach in Iceland. Uh, these pieces of ice are literally a thousand years old uh, from these glaciers that have been there and they wash up on the shore. And here I was trying to show some motion by using a slower shutter speed, let that wave sort of move through the scene, but try to get a nice tack sharp piece of ice. So it kind of reminds me of a diamond on uh, uh, black silk. Everyday life, another category. So these are all categories of a shot list. Um, where do you think this picture was made? Yep, yeah. why? Because of the, the, the painting there in the background, right? So I consider this more of an environmental portrait, right? I could have just zoomed in on her, and you probably would have had no idea where the shot was made. But that little detail of including that, that painting tells you immediately where that shot was made. So look for those extra little uh, details that are going to add to the, the shot. You know, if I get a photograph of a a Bedouin uh, nomad in the desert, I probably want to get some camels in the background. But I'm also going to just get him as well. Remember, there's no one way to photograph a scene. So you want to get a variety of shots. Here, uh, where do you think this shot was made? <laughs> Cuba, right? Well. I guess you can set up these shots, but I rarely will ever set up you know, people or anything. Um, to me, the fun of travel photography is just being in the right place at the right time. So here we are walking the streets of Old Havana. This wonderful red truck, red, I love the color red for photography. And this cute little boy just walks up out of nowhere and he's got a shirt that says Cuba on it. I mean, how you know, much luckier could you get? So to me, that's, you know, those are the moments when I'm like, nice, <laughs> this is why I, why I do this. But um, you know, these are just people doing what they do. So I you know, call that everyday life. People just sitting in doorways, on door stoops, looking out windows. Uh, this lady selling cigars and eggs in, uh, in her doorway. Uh, so this is in Havana as well. So a little bit less telling because other than the cigars, which, you know, of course they have cigars in a lot of places, uh, but you may not know that this was actually in Cuba until I told you. Here, a uh, dog that just happened to be looking out this little peephole in a door in Trinidad, Cuba. Here you get a pretty good sense of the rule of thirds, right? So we've got one-third of the cement on one side, two-thirds of the door on the left-hand side. Trying not to place my subject right smack in the center. Here a man uh, playing guitar on the streets of uh, Trinidad, Cuba. Great time of day, so this was uh, around sunset, sun's low in the sky, so you got this wonderful shadow. Uh, I moved so that I could see the shadow and really highlight that shadow as opposed to had I been a couple steps to the left, that man would have been blocking that shadow, right? So I call that manipulating the scene, moving around it until it does what you want it to do. So I wanted to move to the right to reveal that shadow more. 
Here a man smoking a hookah in Turkey. Just people doing what they do, everyday life. Here a gentleman pounding out horseshoes in Turkey. His friend having a cup of tea, which they all do, while he's uh, talking to him, keeping him company. Uh, this man told us uh, he was 85 years old, and he repairs saddles, these old saddles. So he's going to take, yeah, this is a saddle. This is the bottom side of a saddle. Um, now, on the street that he is on, he said there's only him and one other man left, and I think the other guy is 90 years old. But at one time, in the, you know, the heyday of saddles and horses and things, uh, there used to be 12 of these people, you know, enough business for 12 of these guys to, to exist. Now they're down to two, and they're both over 85 years old. But just a super guy, he, uh, smiley, just wonderful person. Here, uh, this is on the streets of Hanoi, Vietnam. And I'm walking along, and I see this barber in his chair. And in the mirror here are some girls reflected that are behind, you know, right? You know, they're behind to my left. So I moved around. I'm walking. I'm, I'm hoping to take a picture of him reflected in the mirror. And then I see these girls reflected. So again, moving around till I get them just where I want them in the shot and photograph that. So mirrors are, and uh, you know, any kind of reflection, puddles. Uh, if you ever come on a trip with me, you'll see me walking around puddles. You say, what, what's he doing? Well, I'm looking for unique ways to photograph a reflection of something. Here are a couple of very fashionable women just having a drink on the streets of Hanoi, which uh, is uh, Vietnam. You can really see the economy coming back. And uh, I think Cuba aspires to be Vietnam at some point, where they can sort of have this mix of socialism with capitalism, because people are uh, really starting to enjoy a much better way of life in uh, Vietnam in general, but Hanoi, the capital, and Saigon. Uh, which are very cosmopolitan <laughs> cities. So food gastronomy, another category. Now, you probably noticed that most, if not all, of these shots could be many different categories. This could be people, could be food, could be markets, just depends. So uh, rarely, if ever, are you going to take a photograph that's going to be one category. But here, of course, I'm looking, uh, flags is also another category that I've got in my shot list. So what's more distinctive to a country than its flag? Really nothing. So here I want to include that. I want to include the El Socialismo uh, sign in the background. Got this man working uh, with his uh, watermelons and products there in Havana woman uh, selling snakes and eels in Vietnam. Never knew that there was this many varieties of rice until I went to this market in Vietnam. So lots of different grades and qualities and prices. So with all of these things, it's about you know, finding what's distinctive to the place. That's the you know, that's the gold, is when you can find something really distinctive, like the flag. And I'll show you some other things that are very distinctive to their countries. Some more ladies in Vietnam, these uh, wonderful wet markets where they've got these live animals that they sell. Uh, these ladies uh, selling rambutan, this fruit here, wonderful fruit. And uh, the reason I show this shot is uh, they... Uh, were, there were uh, vendors all along the street for maybe two, three blocks. And we were just walking along, photographing, and all of a sudden, all of these vendors picked up and started sort of running away, moving away from where they were set up, taking their blankets and covering their stuff, putting it on their back and running away. And we're like, what's going on? Well, there were some police down the way, and they were selling illegally off the curb. So they were all packing up trying to uh, get away instead of being fined. Uh, here, back in Hanoi, so you have these people that are setting up businesses 
wherever they are, wherever they can, whatever they're selling, they just find a street corner and sell fruit or you know, pho, the soup, whatever it is. Here, a woman in a rice field in Vietnam. Now, uh, there's kind of a funny story behind this shot. Uh, I was with my guide, saw this group of women ac across the freeway, and it was you know, fairly, um, you know, it was more of a, a busy road than anything, and uh, asked if we could pull over, went over there and started photographing them. And so she's talking to the interpreter. He's saying to me, uh, where are you from? Um, originally from Chicago. And then I could tell he was telling her that. Uh, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a travel photographer. And he would tell her that. He says, are you single? <laughs> I says, yeah, <laughs> but I'm not very geographically desirable. <laughs> but uh, she just had the best smile. Every time I look at this picture, I have to smile because she was really fun. So here are a couple of the other women that were working with her. Uh, these hats are called uh, non, non hats, and they're very distinctive to Vietnam. So this is another category of a shot list that we're going to talk about is fashion and style. It's really the clothes and hats and things that people are wearing in a place that are distinctive. Uh, you know, first, you know, being a, kind of an ugly American, and I'm like, boy, those, you know, those seem like tourist hats, you know, touristy hats or, you know, things that they would sell to the tourists. But th they wear these day in and day out. This is something that they wear all the time. And so it's very distinctive to that place. The men have one that's shaped a little bit differently, but it's also called a nun. So they're planting uh, rice for the harvest. Here are then plated food photography. I'm sure we've all done that, taking pictures of our plates of food, whatever restaurant we're at. Uh, I'm, I've shot for, uh, I did a 35 day assignment to shoot for a cookbook on the regional cuisine of Mexico uh, three or four years ago. But I was there to do the travel and cultural images. They had a food photographer who specialized in that. Uh, the, the publisher is actually Australian. So they had a food photographer in Australia setting up these plates of Mexican food and photographing them there, but I was doing all the local travel stuff that would complement the food photography. But uh, here I am in uh, San Sebastian, Spain, which uh, if you've heard of or been, you know, you know it's one of the culinary capitals of the world. And so this octopus tentacle is probably this long. And uh, so I was there scouting for a future trip that I'm doing, but just trying to you know, practice a little bit of my food photography. Always nice to use shallower depth of field. So those of you who aren't familiar, depth of field, the amount of the image from front to back that's in focus. So you can see there's a very small focal plane here. You know, it's probably right in here. But behind and in front, very much out of focus. So that's really good for portrait photography, food photography. So. Here, Ha Long Bay, Vietnam, uh, so woman who's got these live shrimp and crabs and fish and you name it, and these little colanders that are floating in the water and the fish are swimming around. It's kind of a pretty clever way. And look, she's got these little floats on here. It's a clever way to keep your, your product fresh. And so that's how she was selling her wares. Landscapes, so a little bit difficult to see over here, much better uh, exposure if you look on the monitors. But uh, this is Halong Bay too. So these are limestone formations called karsts. If anyone's been to Cuba, you've been out to the western part called Vinales. They have a very similar structure out there they call mogotes, uh, but there's no water. But if the water had receded like it did in Cuba, if it had done that here, it'd be very similar. So uh, Halong Bay, one of the really otherworldly landscapes that you will see. Here I've chosen to convert this to black and white. Really emphasizes those layers. 
So we're actually uh, walked up about 450 steps to you know maybe about this height equivalent across the bay. So I'm shooting from up above down onto the bay. Here, a little floating fishing village. So people actually live here, stay here overnight. They've got their facilities. They can be right there to, uh, to, to go do their fishing. And here I've converted that previous image to black and white. Here, a town called Vama in uh, Bukovina, Romania. So getting out early when there's nice mist and fog. Here back in Turkey, a town called Uchisar. Now if you'll notice, uh, there's actually, uh, there's a town up here and you can walk up to this point. And I believe I've got a shot that I'll show you. I was up there photographing back down. Here back in Romania. So this man taking his milk from the cows that he owns, bringing them to the co-op where they sell them as one big lot. You can see uh, the cow, or excuse me, the, the horse. Horse has this uh, red, it's yarn hanging from his head. And that's like an evil eye. So it's meant to keep away the evil spirits. And if it's a single horse, he'll have two of them. If it's two horses on the same cart, one will have it on the left and the other will have it on the right. So it's an interesting custom that, that, that they yeah. do there. But uh, getting out early at the time of day when these guys are doing this, when there's mist in this valley, really pays off. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, this is actually one of the hotels that we stay at in Romania. It's just outside of the town of Braun, which if you've heard of uh, Dracula's Castle, which is in Transylvania, it's, uh, well, you know, Dracula wasn't a real person, obviously, but, and uh, Bram Stoker never set foot in Romania, but he set that story here. But uh, beautiful, beautiful country. I was blown away by it, and uh, just got invited by a tour operator there. Hey, I see you don't do tours to Romania. Would you be interested in coming over and um, you know con consider leading some, you know, bringing some people back here? So I was definitely interested, and I absolutely fell in love with the country. Fascinating place. Uh, I'll show you some other pictures, but it's it's like a step back in time, but you still have a really nice infrastructure of hotels and roads and buses and restaurants, and so you get the best of both worlds. Here back in Halong Bay. Uh, I am always grumbling when there are no clouds. And you can see how there's so much a part of this picture, half of it is just blank sky, right? So typically I would frame this more of a panorama. Uh, I think for a while I used this as my Facebook cover page, you know, where it's more of a panorama crop. So I could take out some of this water, some of that sky and really focus the viewer's attention to the more interesting part in the middle. Yep. So I say emphasize what's interesting and de-emphasize what's not. So typically I'm framing out this blank sky in this kind of a scene. Now here, you know, good use of the rule of thirds. So I got about a third water here on the Mekong Delta and about two thirds sky. Got these beautiful clouds, very ominous. Uh, the woman against a, a nice clear background. So is the boat. Want to try to avoid overlapping. Turkey, uh, Cappadocia, Turkey. If you've been there, and you've one of the things you have to do is go on a hot air balloon ride. Absolutely wonderful. Even if you're afraid of heights like I am, it was outstanding. About a hundred balloons go up. And it's not scary. This is the shot I meant to tell you about uh, earlier that I was up on that little point. And so I probably took that other shot up from down here somewhere. But I like these people in the foreground. I like the shadow here. 
that's what attracted me to that scene. That's what made me photograph it, was those people. And I'll talk a little bit later about adding a human touch to your photography. Another landscape, uh, Havana, Cuba. So this is along the Malecon. In the background, you see the famous uh, lighthouse and uh, fortress back there, El Moro Fortress. And at certain times of year when the water seas are a little bit rough, you get these wonderful waves. So if you time it right, you can get some really nice shots, reflections. Natural wonders, another category of a shot list. Now certainly, Ha Long Bay could be in this category, right? Uh, so that was, those were landscapes, but talk about wonderful natural wonders, Ha Long Bay. Uh, this is actually up in Lapland, Sweden and Finland. So on our Lapland trip, we go back and forth across the border between Sweden and Finland and uh, go see the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. Certainly not guaranteed. If you look on the monitors, I think much better view. But um, these uh, are natural formations, of course. Obviously, they're, you know, we can't guarantee that you'll see them when we go. But uh, really interesting, something I'd never seen. Now, this is probably a, a 12 or 15 second exposure. So there's really no special equipment required for this type of photography, except you definitely need a tripod obviously, for that, that long of an exposure. But uh, when you're there, it's, it's a little bit less dramatic. So when you've got a 12 or 15 second exposure, much more of that light is hitting your sensor and you get these types of scenes. And uh, my tour operator is there right now and he says the lights are just going crazy. So uh, we're looking forward to a really nice trip in March. Uh, here, full moon in the background, you can see the stars. Trying to add a little bit of a foreground here with the trees. Really fascinating uh, natural wonder. So here I was light painting one of the, my fellow photographers. So I just took a flashlight and painted her during that 10 second exposure. Asked her to stay still. So while she's looking through the camera, I'm light painting her, but still was able to expose on the background as well. Here, if any of you have been to Iceland, you probably recognize Gullfoss, right? The Golden Falls. Beautiful, beautiful, amazing place. So here's more of the postcard shot I was talking about, bigger overall establishing shot. And then I zoom in on the detail. Here I'm using a longer exposure, trying to feather that water using a tripod. But, uh, you know, longer exposures can be kind of fun. Here, another waterfall there, very famous. I can't even pronounce it. <laughs> but you can actually walk behind this waterfall. You see these people here are going to walk behind the waterfall. Uh, here's one of my tour participants. So you get these rainbows. I actually saw a round rainbow, a 360 degree round rainbow. But I wasn't quick enough to photograph it because it kind of came and went in about two seconds but I've never seen anything like that. So here you can see I'm starting to walk behind the waterfall. Some people here, so I want to add that scale. I want those people there. I know a lot of times we're like, oh, I can't wait till those people get out of my shot. Well, I like to have the one or two people there, right, to add some scale, what I call adding a human touch. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Kind of the same thing here, another waterfall there in uh, northwestern Iceland. Now here, uh, icebergs there on, uh, in one of the iceberg bays, but you can see I've chosen, again, to de-emphasize what's not interesting, which is the, the water below here, and emphasize what's more interesting above. So I framed just below this beautiful iceberg, and then this one I decided to convert to black and white. So it could kind of have some fun doing that. You 
Night scenes, another category. So make sure you're getting out at night. This is going to be a really fun time to be photographing. Uh, here, this is in uh, Kotor, Montenegro. Has anyone been to Kotor? The one or two, two of you. One of my favorite places in the world. Absolutely love it. Uh, it's one of those Venetian walled cities that are left over from you know 500 years ago or so. And so you've got this amazing fortress, very well kept. And up here is a hike that you can take. Now it's more of a switchback to the top up here. And when we arrived during the day, I told my people, I said, we're going up there tomorrow. And they're like, no way, that's, that's I, they couldn't even believe that we would go up there. I had an 82 year old man that made it all the way to the top. And uh, you talk about amazing views from up there. But at night, they light it really nicely. Here, uh, this is the view from my hotel room in Istanbul. So looking right out over the uh, Blue Mosque and the Hagia Sophia, the Bosphorus, beautiful. Here, getting above Dubrovnik. So Dubrovnik sort of, there's a hill over here. You can get up there and get some really nice photographs above the, the walled city. Another one of those Venetian walled cities. Couple sisters in Hoi An, Vietnam. They sell these little sort of baskets with a candle in them for about a dollar. And then you float them down the river. And you can see hundreds of these candles floating down the river. And I'm like, well, do I really want to contribute to that? Do I want, you know, to sort of litter like that. I mean, yeah, it's beautiful, but but then I realized that their little brothers were down the river <laughs> collecting them and selling them back to people. <laughs> so at least it was recycling, right? So that I don't mind contributing to. But really nice light on their faces just from the candles. Here back in uh, Hanoi, this is uh, this red bridge. On the, this wonderful lake, this is a pagoda. A little difficult to see in this lighting, but you can see it much better over here. Uh, using a very small aperture on a tripod, of course. I want to try to get those starbursts in the, in the lights over here. So that requires a very small aperture. Stop down your camera. You know you stop down a lens, you stop up a toilet. You realize that? Uh, Okay, so a couple additional categories. Uh, culture and customs. What are people doing in a place that's different? We saw the man smoking the hookahs. A lot of different customs. Uh, you know, the horses with the, the uh, evil eye. What are people wearing in a place that's different? The, the non hats that we saw the, the women wearing in Vietnam. How's the language being used in a place? Souvenirs and crafts, what are people creating and selling that's different? And something that I call the underbelly. And what I mean by that is uh, it's, it's those things that the tourist office probably isn't advertising. Might be homelessness or graffiti, things like that. But if you want to tell the whole story, that's part of it. Okay, so you ready for my number one photo tip? Guaranteed to take your photography to another level? You've been waiting for this, right? Okay, here we go. Patrick Symes, a photographer says, if you don't like getting up early, then be a writer. <laughs> Simple as that. If you wait until 10, 11, 12 o'clock to get out there, number one, you're out there with all the other tourists, you're in the worst light of the day. Um, you know, I like to get out early now, and, I, and I'm not talking about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm talking 7, 7.30, 8 o'clock. Because what's happening at that time? The city's awakening, the city's awakening, right? The people are on their way to work. Kids are on their way to school. The sun's in a good place usually. You know, depending on what time of year you are, the sun can rise at 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning, but 
Uh, at least you have better light. There's less crime, because when do you think the local criminals are going to be out? When the tourists are out, right? And they're not getting out there till 10, 11 o'clock, because they're sleeping in. So better light, less crowds, mostly if not only the locals, which are the people that I want in my photographs. Uh, there's less bugs out in the morning. So a lot of different reasons. It's cooler and hotter climates. A lot of reasons to get out early. And I say if you do get out early, and we do sometimes. Uh, the one time I could really think of it is when we go to Angkor Wat in uh, Cambodia, a place where you have to go see the sunrise at Angkor Wat. It's the law if you go there, right? So we get up about 4.15, we leave the hotel at 5, and we're there in time to see the sunrise behind this amazing structure, the largest religious complex in the world. So I say if you get up early, you're done at 9, 10 o'clock. I mean, you're out there at 5, you're done at 9 or 10 o'clock. Go back and take what I call a, a photographer's siesta. I say there's a nap for that, right? So just go take a nap during the worst time of the day, right, midday. So my feeling is 75% of good photography is simply making an effort to be in the right place at the right time. If you'll do that, you're golden. You're 75% of the way there. If you're standing there with Steve McCurry, Art Wolf, Bob Chris, the top photographers in the world, if you're standing in the same place as them, you're on the same playing field with them, right? You're at the same place at the same time. So the other 25% is a little bit about the gear, but first tip in my book is it's not about the camera, right? Best camera is the one you have with you. Uh, it's a little bit about experience, but it's mostly about luck. But being there in the right place at the right time, I find myself getting lucky more often than not. So let me show you a, an after picture. Okay, so I was in Toledo, Spain, uh, scouting for my central Spain trip, the heart of Spain. And this shot was made at noon. Okay, worst time of day, right? Really harsh light, there were crowds out, no clouds in the sky this day. So what happened is I said, uh, I got out early, and by early I mean 8 o'clock in the morning. I was out there at 8 o'clock in the morning in this exact same spot, got my shots, went back to my hotel, had breakfast, laid down for a little bit, looked out the window at noon, and I saw this. I saw this blank blue, uh, blue sky, really harsh light. I said, I'm going to go all the way back to where I was photographing this morning, four hours ago, and I want to take an after picture. So do you think it was worth getting out there four hours earlier for this shot? Look at this beautiful golden light, gorgeous clouds, four hours earlier. So you just never know when those clouds are going to go away. I say morning mist and good light wait for no one. So get out there early. This is uh, in Romania. Uh, here I am in Cairo, and I saw this woman wearing this beautiful pink outfit, blowing in the breeze. So I got a couple quick shots of her. And then I got back to my hotel that night, and I started looking at the pictures, and I realized that the pyramids are up here in the background. And I had no idea. I did not plan that. I could tell you that I did, but I didn't. So that's where you get lucky. It just happened that way, and I framed it just right um, because there it's very smoggy, and so I probably couldn't have even seen them with the naked eye, but I got lucky. Here, this is in Trakai, Lithuania. So I'm, I'm here with my, my local guide, and she recommends that we go inside the castle, and something that I wanted to do. I said, we're standing right here, we've got these beautiful clouds, this nice light, let me get some shots here real quick before we go in. So I do that, get my shots, come out 
45 minutes to an hour later, and it was this. You know, talk about blah. Got a pretty nice light on the, the castle itself, but man, what a blank sky, right? So that was just 45 minutes later. So get the shot now. Don't say I'll come back later. When, you know, in this kind of situation where you know, clouds may come or go, the light's changing. OK, a few additional tips. Something I call my ABCs of photography. I say that my mom taught me the one thing that I could use in photography that is one of the best things I could ever learn, and she's never picked up a camera in her life. And that was simply to always be curious. So I call that the ABCs of photography. Patience and curiosity are the two best qualities that you could have as a photographer. Dorothy Parker says the cure to boredom is curiosity. There is no cure for curiosity. Pretty profound. So are you ready? What I mean by that is I'm often asked by my groups, what should my settings be? You know, we get off the bus, we're in a place. Hey, Ralph, what should my settings be? Well, it depends, right? You knew I was going to say that. It depends. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? Do you want to show motion? Use a slow shutter speed. Do you want to stop the action? Use a faster shutter speed. Do you want a shallow depth of field? Use a wider aperture. So it just depends what you're trying to accomplish. I say be sure your camera settings are right for these conditions. Because last night we might have been on a night shoot. But this morning we're out for sunrise and you still have your settings from the night shoot, right? You got your image stabilization, vibration reduction off because you turned it off because you were on a tripod. Maybe you've got the two second timer on and we've all done that. You take a picture and it's like, what, uh, what's going on? Oh, click. Forgot I had my self timer on, right? We've all done that. Uh, so make sure your camera settings are right for these conditions. So I go over my camera every time I I change an environment, and I make sure that my settings are right for those conditions. At least it gives me a starting point. And then I can experiment and change from there. So I say shoot in auto. You're like, what? Shoot in auto? Are you kidding me? Wait for it. I say set your camera up so that it's essentially a point and shoot camera. Okay, so these are my recommendations for photographing travel photography. Say no to manual mode, right? That big M on your camera, right? You're still a photographer if you don't shoot in manual, okay? A lot of people say, oh, you're not a real photographer if you can't shoot in manual. Well, I had some ladies on my Morocco trip a few years ago, and they were... Uh, Struggling, I could tell. We were in the market in Fez, and this is a really busy, fast-moving market. And I came up to her and said, ladies, what's going on? She says, I just can't get my settings right. So I look at her camera, and it's, she's in manual mode. I said, well, you got to get out of manual. You, you know, you just, uh, why are you shooting in manual? She says, well, I just took a landscape photography workshop before this trip, and the guy said I should shoot in manual. Well, that makes sense for land, some landscape photography, right? Product photography, portrait photography, places where you can control the environment, right? So you can do all these things, you've got time. But when you're in a fast moving market, the last thing you have is time. So if you're fumbling around for settings, you're missing photo ops every which way. So I say let the camera do the work. And by that, I mean shooting in a priority mode, like aperture priority or shutter priority. Now, if you're not familiar with those settings, aperture priority, I choose the aperture or the size of the opening. 
camera tells me the appropriate shutter speed to get what it thinks is the correct exposure. Shutter priority, I choose the shutter speed. It tells me the appropriate aperture to get that effect. If I want a long shutter speed, it's gonna give me the right aperture to get a proper exposure. So those are called priority modes. In a priority mode, the camera is always letting in the same amount of light, right? So if I've got a wide aperture, what do you think this, you know, what do you think the uh, shutter speed's gonna be? Fast, right? It's letting in a lot of light this way, it's gonna open up really quickly. I've got a small aperture, it's gonna wanna stay open longer to let in the same amount of light. And the way to think about that is, think of a pipe of water. If you've got a narrow pipe, it needs to stay open longer to let in the same volume of water as a big pipe needs to stay open a shorter period of time to let in the same volume of water. We're just talking about light. So in a priority mode, the camera's letting in the same amount of light. Uh, program mode, the camera does both the aperture and the shutter speed, but you still have some other, uh, you can still play with some of the other settings. Where in full auto, all you're doing is really pointing and shooting, letting the camera make all those decisions. And that's fine if it gets you the shot. I'm not going to ask you if you, you know, I do a lot of image reviews and critiques and things, and I'm going to say, well, what mode were you in when you shot this? You know, you know if you tell me auto, I'm not going to look down on you because if it's a nice shot, it's a nice shot. I don't care what mode you shot it in. I use matrix or evaluative metering or whatever it's called on your camera. That's where the camera takes into account the whole scene for its computation of exposure, as opposed to spot metering. Auto ISO. So uh, I, I've just moved from a full frame Nikon D610 to a uh, Micro Four Thirds camera. Just bought myself one for Christmas. And um, on my D610, it's got this auto ISO capability where I could tell the camera, if you see my shutter speed get below one one hundredth of a second or whatever setting I want, floor, it starts to bump up my ISO to maintain that minimum shutter speed. Comes in really handy when I'm outside photographing in the bright sunny uh, plaza and then I walk into a church. One less thing I've got to think about. So this is what I mean about turning your camera into uh, you know, point and shoot. Get the settings so that it's right. So now all you have to do is notice the photo opportunity and photograph it. How many of you are shooting in RAW? Okay, fairly small percentage, maybe 15, 20% of you. Uh, RAW is a file format, so the way I explain it, would you rather have someone cook a meal for you from a table full of fresh raw ingredients from scratch or throw a TV dinner in the oven, right? Sometimes you just want a TV dinner, <laughs> but you know, I would rather have someone you know, make a fresh from scratch meal for me. So that raw file uh, I've, I've heard has 40,000 times the amount of information as a JPEG. Now the file size is typically two to three times as big so it's gonna take up more card space, more hard drive space, computer space, but buy more. <laughs> buy more cards, buy more hard drives. They're very, very inexpensive. So that file, because it's got three or four, you know, it's three or four times bigger and has all that more information, is a much more forgiving file format when you blow out the highlights or you block up the shadows. Now you can bring back some of that stuff to get the right exposure. So I don't want to get too deep into that. Okay, so I say you're ready when you've got your settings on auto. <laughs> so you've got them right for those conditions. You're in the right place at the right time. You've recognized the photo opportunity. You have to recognize it. You've experimented. And what I mean by that is oftentimes we uh, have a, a little phobia for photographing people, right? Uh, I know I did at the beginning when I started shooting. But what I say is, 
if you see a person that you want to photograph, maybe it's a vendor, someone working in a, you know, a, a market or something, try to experiment over here, say the photo opportunity is over here, experiment over here in the same lighting conditions, maybe with your friend or wife or husband, photograph them, same distance, get everything right, make sure you got everything looking good, then go to that person and you go boom, 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 and you're done in 10 seconds. Instead of coming up to that person, what I was always fearful of was taking that person's time, right? So I'd go up to them, you know, I'd say, oh, wait, just a minute. I, you know, I got to look at my histogram. Oh, what, what, you know, what's aperture priority? What, you know, hang on, I just, you know, I get all flustered. And of course, the person's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> so experiment over here and be ready and boom, 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 now you get the shots. So don't delay, shoot away. Just say no to this. <laughs> this is actually a participant on one of my trips. Now, of course, he's joking with the tripod on his head, but he is one of those photographers that will go out with two bodies, two lenses, and God knows what else on his you know, bandolier here. That's just not my way of doing photography. Now, that's fine if that's your way. It's fine if it's his way, as long as I don't have to carry your gear. Uh, but to me, it can be really intimidating for someone like this to walk up to another you know, person, a local, and begin to photograph them. And that's one of the reasons that I'm going from these bigger DSLR cameras to that micro four thirds camera. It's less intimidating to the subject. It's much lighter and smaller for me to carry around the world. During the trip, think about the quality and direction of light. So really look at the scene. How's the light affecting your subject? Can you move them around? Can you move around to change the way the light's hitting them? Look deeper into the scene for backgrounds that are either complementary to the scene. Remember we talked about that Bedouin with the camels in the background? That to me would be complementary. Or do I want to move around and block out something in the background by getting down and having my subject hide that, whatever that is in the background? Mm. Look deeper into the scene, because how many times have you come home and you say, oh my god, I didn't see that telephone pole coming right out of that person's head. All right? So that's what I mean by watching your backgrounds. Watch your backgrounds. Really important. Whenever I do image reviews and critiques, uh, you know, I see these things happening in the background, and I point it out to people, and they're like, I didn't even notice that. So really look deeper into the scene. To me, it's about timing and anticipation. So as a photographer, uh, especially in these moving scenes like markets and stuff, you have to uh, sort of tell the future. And what I mean by that is you have to anticipate that person walking in front of that background and where do you want to actually get that picture, you know, unless you're doing continuous and going, ch -ch 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 -ch, you know, and hope, you know, spray and pray, right? But if you could get that person walking by that particular background and you've got their legs spread apart like that instead of, you know, like this from the side, probably going to be a better shot like this. So it's about timing and anticipation, anticipating where that person's going to be, where you want to photograph them. And I say get into the rhythm of the place. And that comes back to this part where someone's walking in front of a background that you want to photograph. But also, let's say you're photographing that guy pounding out horseshoes and there's sparks flying. You know, and that guy's going boom, boom, boom. And you're just like click, 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 right? You're in the rhythm of the place. Think about that when you're out there. Turn that camera 90 degrees. You know, I see a lot of portfolios, and all it is is landscape versions of photographs, horizontal versions, right? Just like this. Well, that camera works this way, too. Turn that camera 90 degrees. Boom. Okay? You double your photo opportunities if you get a landscape version and a portrait version. 
right? Because when you're putting together books, slideshows, websites, presentations, and we can all do that, you may need a portrait version for a particular layout. So turn that camera 90 degrees. Now, I learned this. Um, I got my first cover this past April. Uh, it's not something that I go for. This is a whole other job trying to get cover, uh, covers of magazines, writing articles with photography. Um, but I was approached by this uh, magazine, Asian Photography, to do a feature on me, and, and there were several other photographers, travel photographers. Well, they had been looking on my website, and there was a particular image that they wanted for the cover. Well, I was in Turkey leading my tour, and by the way, the magazine closes tomorrow. <laughs> so we need that full res image tomorrow. Well, I didn't have that image with me, because you can imagine I've got like 16 terabytes of images on various hard drives at home. The Library of Congress is like four terabytes. <laughs> so I've got like 16 terabytes worth of images. So that particular image was sitting somewhere on a hard drive, not on my computer. So I'm scrambling to find any high-res portrait version images that I had with me so that I could say, you know, I don't have that image in a high-res file, but I do have these. So sure enough, they selected this image. And I'll show you, uh, this was the original. But if this was a landscape version, they would have had to crop into it to get a portrait version of it, which probably wasn't going to happen. So that's what I mean, get a landscape and a portrait version of just about every scene. Uh, I didn't do this intentionally, but I do think about it nowadays, because this image was actually made 10 years ago. But you give some room up top there for them to put the header of the magazine. Right? So uh, sometimes that clear sky can actually do well for you because then it gives a nice clear space for them to put the magazine title. Now remember I talked about that adding that human touch? So that previous shot with my friend there, I like that shot much better than this one. Right? This one kind of seems empty, doesn't it? You know, it's an interesting rock formation, nice colors, but it's empty. So that's what I mean, add that human touch. This was the original shot that they wanted for the cover. I like it. I don't know if it's cover worthy, but that was the one that they wanted. And so I just found it to put into the slideshow, give you a comparison. But thank goodness I still I had some shots that they did want to choose from. Uh, this was actually the interior of that. This was the uh, the feature that they did. Several of my shots here. Now the reason I show you this shot is, you know, it's an interesting. I, I have never been to a place where they had these terraced rice fields. Now this is in Bhutan, and I like the shot. It's kind of an abstract textures, layers, things like that, but. To me, it's more of an abstract shot than anything. I'm standing there with my local guide, Fixer, in Bhutan, and I said, you know what? I need someone in red to walk into this scene because otherwise I'm done here. This is boring, right? Literally a minute later, this guy walks into the scene. Now, I didn't see him over here in the distance walking into the frame and you know, trying to set up my guide. It was luck. Just total luck. I like red and yellow are usually really great colors. But you can see the difference. It, I t it takes that other shot and brings it to a whole nother level to have that person, especially in red, in this scene. The blue hour. So we know about the golden hour, that you know sunrise, sunset. But just before sunrise and after sunset is what's called the blue hour. Now, this shot I made in Rovin, uh, Croatia. This is a 30-second shot. That's why the water's all flat like that. So this shot was made four minutes earlier than this next shot, exact same settings. 
exact same settings, four minutes later this shot was made. And the reason I show it is you can really see that that blue hour just sort of turns on. At sunset it turns on, at sunrise it turns off. <laughs> Again, four minutes earlier, four minutes later. So really dramatic difference. Here, Budapest, Chain Bridge, Parliament, Krakow, Poland, Prague. So it's just a wonderful time of day to be out there photographing. Dubrovnik, again above Dubrovnik. Lake Bled, Slovenia. Here I got double duty with the reflection in the water. Back in Istanbul. Give back. What I mean by that is I have the luxury of going back to places over and over again. Uh, maybe you do as well, but I'm lucky I get to go bring people back. What I like to do is take photographs like this one of this woman uh, along the riverfront there in uh, Phnom Penh. She sells bananas, incense, flowers for people to give offerings. So I made this photograph of her. Number one, uh, I went to go buy something from her. I wanted to buy some bananas because I like to buy things from the vendors that I photograph. That's the exact reason I don't photograph car salesmen. Right? Uh, no, so I was going to buy some bananas from her for you know 50 cents or a dollar, and uh, she wouldn't have it. She would not. She gave me the bananas. Would not take any money from me. I'm taking her picture. She's giving me something, right? So it really touched my heart. So next year I come back with a group and I bring that picture and I give it to her. She's in that exact same spot, right? And almost always they are, and uh, she started crying. She was so touched that I brought this back to her. Here, a man in Trinidad, Cuba. Brought back to him. Young girl at the end of the bamboo train in uh, Cambodia. She sells these little bracelets and things that I buy from them. Brought that picture back to her. This little boy was in Copper Canyon, Mexico, and I don't like the shadows on his face, right? Uh, you know, again, it's that sunlight shadow thing that I don't particularly care for, but I was going back to Copper Canyon with a group. Anyone been to Copper Canyon, Mexico? One person, one person. It's four times bigger and it's deeper than the Grand Canyon, and there's one of the great train rides of the world right through it. It's, it's an amazing place, and they have the Tarahumara Indians that live there uh, they're known for their affinity for long distance running. They can run for days at a time, literally. There's a book out called Born to Run about them. Fascinating culture. Very shy people, open to being photographed, but I have never seen a Tarahumara Indian smile, laugh, chuckle, anything. So I'm going back with a group. I bring uh, this picture back, and I'm showing it around the area that I knew I had taken it. So I show it to this woman. So number one, I find the little boy, right? And I like the fact he's wearing that Chicago Bear shirt. <laughs> but I uh, find the little boy, now I wouldn't have recognized him. Two years later, you know, he was probably two in the first shot. But his mother, I, like again, never seen a in Tarahumara person smile. She did not stop smiling for 15 minutes because I brought her back this 29 cent picture. So. I, I say, you know, bring back these very inexpensive, very lightweight, but very powerful images back to people if you feel like you might run into them again and you have the luxury of going back. Uh, another couple little girls I took on that same first trip, showing that picture around, showed it to this one little girl, she didn't know who it was, show it to these girls, they say, it's that girl you just showed the picture to. Well, she was probably five in that picture. Now she's maybe seven. A lot of these people don't have mirrors. They don't own pictures of themselves. You know, they change a lot as kids. So 
she f went and grabbed her cousin, who was the other girl in the picture, and I made this shot of them. Didn't even recognize herself. Very similar thing happened here in Chefchaou in Morocco, one of my favorite places in the world. And this little girl obviously just getting in my face and I'm photographing her. So I'm back in Chefchaou in just in October and I bring this picture back and I knew exactly where I'd made it. And there's a young girl there and I say to my guide, I said, could you ask this girl if she knows who this other girl is? She says, that's me. That's me. And another man in the area confirmed it, that that was her in this picture. Well, you know, see how I like to take pictures of people with the photograph? She wasn't, ha <laughs> she wasn't having it this time. This is the only way she'd let me shoot her. I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> so be the subject, too. We go to these wonderful places. Sometimes we forget to get in the photographs ourselves. Here's a selfie with me and my group in Morocco. Picture someone else took of me. Copper Canyon on the Zip Rider, little selfie stick going there. I was one of those guys. Here I am being blessed by one of the ladies that gives out some of these little bracelets in uh, Cambodia at Angkor Wat. She's blessing me, so this is a shot by another one of my tour participants. So make sure that you're getting shots of yourselves. Uh, here I am on a 300-year-old lava field. With, it's got moss about that deep in Iceland. So our local guide made this shot. So make sure you turn that camera on yourself once in a while. Uh, finally, here's a time lapse that I did. I love to do time lapses. If you're not familiar with what a time lapse is, it's a, a, taking a picture like every one second for a period of time. Now I made this next time lapse over 10 minutes. Took a picture every one second over 10 minute period and then it compresses into about 30 seconds. This is in Dubrovnik, Croatia. So I'm standing there and people are just walking by. Kind of fun. Now that was made with my iPhone. If you have a newer iPhone, you have that capability on your iPhone. Slow motion, fantastic. If you see people doing stuff that you can get some slow motion, I love to do slow motion photography. Ansel Adams says a good photograph is simply knowing where to stand. Remember, it's that whole idea of manipulating the scene, moving around it, see what it does. Now get out and shoot. Get out there, practice the things that you've learned today. Hopefully you took a couple little nuggets from here. All the things you do, just get out there and shoot. You can't get worse at photography, okay? If you're out there doing it, you can only get better. Thank you very much, thank you. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.